my goal is not to prove to anybody that I'm the smartest person, the most able person in the world, because I'm not. I'm just me, and, and that's it. <laughs> I can't give you more, but I commit myself to give you the best of what I can do. I'm fully committed, I'm 100% committed mm -hmm. to you, to anybody that I'm talking to. I try to be all of myself. No one could ever doubt Yo-Yo Ma's commitment to music over countless beautiful, timeless recordings, to all of these amazing performances that don't just speak to fans, but often speak to the moment, to what's going on in culture and society. There are times that Yo-Yo Ma has shown up, performed, and healed nations. And here we are in a cafe in New York City, one of my favorite spots in the world, to talk to someone whose music heals me all the time. Put a pot of coffee on, because we did, and enjoy this conversation with the remarkable Yo-Yo Ma. We're gonna have some coffee. We're gonna have some coffee. Thank God we're gonna have some coffee. Yeah, right? So I can't wait to have some coffee. What's your intake a day? Ah, oh, I take like three espressos in the morning. <laughs> Line boom, them up. Boom, boom. One, two, three. <laughs> it's funny because uh, I don't want too much milk, and so this way it's like you know, yeah, it's fast. And yeah. and uh, I love how you won't drink a long black though. You just have three espressos. <laughs> you know, <laughs> right? Well, it's it's kind of yeah. I don't know. I don't know why. It's just kind of feels good that way. If I'm really drowsy, I'll put in a little sugar. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And and sometimes if I feel frisky, I'll put a little cinnamon in. You know, it's like, just like the... <laughs> I've never done that. Really? A little cinnamon in a cinnamon in is nice. Though. Yeah. That's a vibe. Yeah, it's really good. I'm try that out. Or just, you know, if you like a little excitement. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think, like, uh, when it comes to actually being inspired to, to play your instrument or to to be drawn into something that's creative. Ooh, it, nice. It, it, it never really works in a schedule. It's not a scheduled thing. Are there, no, are there moments when you just can't go to sleep or you can't move because the, the drawer is too strong? You must... No, never. I just, I just, when I open the cello case, uh, I've gotten to the point where it's always my friend. And that's what you, I think, when I was younger, sometimes you have to fight your way in, you know, because I gotta do this, I gotta do this, and it just doesn't work. You just kinda, kinda fit in. It's the way you interview. You get people into that little nice subconscious mode. Thanks, man. It's true, I think so. Well, let's see what's in your subconscious. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just read, I just read, like yesterday, that something like, 5% of our brain is in the conscious mind. And you do the math. Oh, that explains me <laughs> a lot really? better. Yeah, I mean, I sometimes I, I realize what I'm thinking in the moment, and I'm like, wow, I had no idea that was going on in my head, and I had this split second where I'm like very consciously aware of what's going on. I think that's, I think when people say stay in the moment, yeah. that's, that's what people are talking about. They're trying to get you to, not control your thoughts, but be, be, co be conscious of them and try to focus on things that are fulfilling. Well, since we started talking about coffee, in the morning, do you ever wake up having a great idea about something? You're kind of not quite awake, and you think, I better write this down, because if I don't, I'm not going to remember once I wake up. I have done that, and, I, and lately I've started to write little lists and things that I love or that I'm excited about first thing in the morning. And I notice also that I'm a, if I'm gonna have a conversation with somebody that day, that I really love to listen to their music first thing in the morning because I'm very open. Mm. I may have heard the music, I'm prepared, I love the album or I love the songs, but I feel very differently about it first thing in the morning than I did any other time in the day. Interesting, you know? my son tells me Daddy, it's really good if you wake up in the morning, you don't get to do things. You just stay quiet mm -hmm. for like half an hour. Yeah, and this is can the, do that. But then you have three espressos and you're like, that doesn't work for me. Oh, well, I can, I, the during that half hour, I can have three espressos <laughs> and it's totally fine. 
<laughs> you, you know, you wrote something and said something really beautiful about Apple Music Classical, and I want to start, you know, th this portion of our conversation there. Um, you talked about it, um, having a place where we can we can hear what music was thinking, what the artists who, who played it and wrote it were thinking during times in history and, and what was going on outside. Time travel. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. Time, it's what music is. Absolutely. You know? I mean, think about it. If you, if like we're talking right now, but imagine that you could transport yourself to another time and place and and you could be hearing that same conversation mm. or getting into someone's insides, which is what music is. Mm. And I mean, think of, people talk about access. Think, think of the amount, that kind of access you have into the feelings, the, the words, the, the, the sounds, the, you know, the context of what a piece of music can get you. Um, you know, from, I tell you, you, you name the period, I think so much of classical music is what was written down in the last couple hundred years. And the fact that you can get through the code of notation um, into someone's thoughts is kind of miraculous. What we say is classical music was all of music because it wasn't before it was labeled. It was just music. It was mm. church music. Mm. It was folk music. Mm. It was dance music. It was, you know, secular music. It was religious music. It was court music. It was so the fact that a lot of it is being labeled as sort of like, oh, it's sort of like elite music. That kind of is, is it's, it's like saying democracy is elitist. It's, There's a hierarchy to it. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's yeah. like saying our founding fathers were. Elitists. I'm glad you're going there because I wonder what the term meant to you. And I, I thought, is that too bold a question, you know, to ask early on is what does the term classical music mean? Because I, I don't disagree with you. I, I find genres can be efficient, but sometimes misleading. Genres are always efficient. Every, any kind of stereotype mm. has a little bit of truth to it. But as you know, from anything that we do. It right? doesn't relate to feeling. The, the deeper you go, it doesn't relate you to realize, feeling. you know, actually, that's for the birds, yeah. right? And I'll give you an example. I, um, I played a piece of Bach for Winton, Marsalis, and Prelude of the Third Suite. He listens to it and says, man, this is a kick-ass jazz. This is shit. jazz, yeah. yeah. This is because, yeah. because Bach actually was one of the greatest improvisers of his time. Mozart was one of the greatest improvisers. And we don't think of it that way. No. And in fact, most classical musicians improvised, composed, and doing things. But with the industrial society, we became more and more specialized. These days, people will do everything. Yeah. And that's what I'm hoping for, is that people who go into music are not going to be labeled as, oh, you're this kind of, oh, you do this genre, which implies that that's all a human being is capable of doing, is that you can only do this. Mm -hmm. And if you go out of your lane, you're doing something not right. I feel like you've been dedicated to, to creating, recording, and releasing your music in service. I feel like it's more than just a personal desire to be heard or for your talent or your work to be heard, that if you can't feel like you're helping, there's almost, it doesn't have the same, the same reason, the same impact for you. Well, I think we do things for different reasons. And also, often we do uh, something for many reasons. And one of them absolutely is service. I think we do this I think everything that culture is, that, uh, which is what we've invented to examine what's around, mm -hmm. is 
And the reason we do that, obviously some of it is to satisfy our own curiosity. But when you're really excited about something, that's you want to share it with somebody. That's my job. Right. This is my job. That's what you do. Yeah. And you are led by your curiosity. And when you find something, do you keep it a secret? Do you I lock can't. it up in a box? I can't. And you say, I know something, I'm not going to tell you. No. You want people to know. And, and so if that's service, fine. You know, I think in your interview with Barbara Streisand, which is amazing because she said essentially, I'm looking to tell the truth. And she wants the truth in this in a very particular way. And and you got inside her to not focus on the thing that we all think she is. She's a perfectionist, mm. she's difficult to work with. Mm. No, you you realize that she there's something else driving mm. her and you got to that, which is actually much of the motivation behind the strive for what we see on the outside as a, a tendency to want things just the way she wants it. But that's her dedication to her truth. You know, if we think about Barbara Streisand, for decades now, she's been referred to as the voice. She's yeah, the voice. It's the voice. It's the voice, yeah, right? And she was so quick to say, look, I was gifted the voice. I'd be foolish not to use the voice. Yeah. Can you relate to that? Can you relate to what she was saying from a personal level beyond getting to know her better and understanding the true Barbara Streisand, which was amazing that you took that from the conversation and thank you. But do you relate to what she was saying as someone? I who, think I have the greatest voice in the world that nobody recognizes. <laughs> you want to be the voice? Uh, I, I, I don't know why, but you know, <laughs> I've you're tried it all her, my life. You're watching her reject the concept of being the voice and with single tears rolling down your <laughs> exactly. face. If only someone could truly understand. Exactly. These damn hands. <laughs> Nobody knows me. Oh, why? Oh, I the hands, know. Why? What's going on? Man, my beautiful oh. eyes. <laughs> no, but you know what I mean. I think that I think that you know, for, for a long time, from a very very young age, you, you, talent is and the journey it takes you on the life's journey is the greatest is a great gift. But it is a box. It can be a box. People recognize some value in what you do and they want more of it and they want you to be that for us, right? Yeah, it's, it's what's, what's interesting, well, you may be surprised uh, and I may be surprised by what I'm saying too because, <laughs> uh, because yes, at, at a certain point you start from some place, but like Robert Streisand, I think the similarity there is that I just did it. It was part of my family's background in music and um, and in a way I never made a decision about being a musician. I just liked it. Hmm. And so I spent most of my life, I'm 68, and it was I was, you know, almost 50 years old before I realized this is, yes, I, I do this. I love music, I love playing music. But what I really, really have always been uh, passionate about is understanding things around me, understanding people, understanding nature, understanding why people do what they did. And actually, a a, a, a real reason. So I was born in Paris 10 years after World War II. Now, World War II is far away for most people. And, but in Europe, 10 years after, you felt the effect of the war. You really, I mean, people were still going through a lot of PTSD before the word was invented the term was invented. And I think, I feel that I am a child of World War II because I've spent my life trying to understand what happened. Why did it happen? Why did it have to happen? And uh, I mean, 
slaughter on a scale. And then when we came to the United States, so I, I, I was seven years old, 1962. So this was before the assassination, before the civil rights movement. And so I'm an immigrant, as are you, I suppose, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and, and I don't know how you feel about this, but once I became an immigrant and a citizen, I had to ask myself, as I was thinking, what is American music? What is the soul of American music? The way that in different countries, you know, Russian music, oh, this is right, this is French music, this is British. It's American music. And, and in, in looking, I was, I was thinking, you know, just because I came here in 1962, does that mean my ownership of the citizenry that I'm thinking of, what it means to be a citizen, does it, by knowledge of the history of the United States, starts from 62 and I'm not responsible mm. for anything mm. before? Or do I actually have to take on, you know, everything that went on? So I can appropriately contribute. Right. Yeah. Because otherwise, how can I participate yeah. in, yeah. in, yeah. in issues yeah. that that we are all dealing yeah, with it's chosen today. history, yeah. Right, and even pre the forming of the nation, right? So what are we responsible? Now, legally, I know what I'm entitled to be and to think, but not everything is under the aegis of the legal system. Mm. You know, we are also, how are we responsible for yeah. one another? Yeah. And what, I, is our, I, what is our role to thoughtfully contribute to the future of a country that we were not born into? Exactly. What, what has been one of the most emotional experiences you've had performing, not so much from an insular point of view, what you're feeling in the moment yourself, but what you're sensing others are experiencing at that time? Well, I think, you know, the moments we all remember forever where we were when we heard a piece of news, right? 9-11. I was in Colorado Springs. I was in Denver. And, and I was supposed to play that evening in Colorado Springs, Denver the next night, and in Phoenix, Arizona the third night. And uh, I called my wife in the morning. She says, turn on the television. And, you know, we saw what happened. Mm -hmm. And... So the first reaction is, well, maybe everything's canceled. And they thought, you know, President Bush was going to go to, uh, you know, a safe place in the mountains. Every orchestra decided they wanted to hold the concert. And I can tell you that those communal moments when people are together, right, I think to this day, I can go back to Colorado Springs or Denver or Phoenix and everybody who was at that concert mm. remembers mm. it to a T. You know, it's like this was the moment where it's like we were all holding hands and, you know, crying together and being together and standing strong together. Uh, I think there are moments like that the night before the first Iraq war. I was in Washington, D.C., you know. It's, it, it can go on and on and on. Those are kind of big moments, but little moments. You go to, in Chicago, where I was working for 10 years and went into a lot of public schools. And, you know, in the 10 years that, that I was there, every weekend uh, on the south side, about 40 people would get shot. And we decided to go to the parents of the kids to say, what would you have wanted? What song would you have chosen or would your child have chosen? And I was working with a, you know, young musicians in their 20s. And they chose a song, found the singer. We recorded it. They recorded it with the parents there. 
and we put on the website, you know, Notes for Peace, and we're not solving anything, but we are co-witnesses. And there's a public website. You know, it's like the Vietnam Memorial. You know, you can go touch, right, the names of every person that died. Here, we have it online. And the resolve is they're going to do this until every single person has been acknowledged. Because, yes, it shouldn't go on. We don't have the means to solve that. No one person or agency has the means. But eventually, it's going to be the public will that says, enough. So it's just seeding something for a future that we may not see. But you know it's going to, but there's enough DNA there. And if people take that on, it's going to continue. If they don't, then it's a failed experiment. But for those that were there, it's not a failed experiment. I just don't think we'll be around long enough to know whether we succeeded or failed, and so we must just continue. Right. right. It's, that's, that's the, the fact of human nature, right? We're capable of the greatest inventions, the greatest you know, moments of, of everything, as well as the greatest cruelty, and it never ends. You know, your life has been so fascinating for so many reasons, but one I keep coming back to is that you are an outlier. You are, you're someone who searches around convention, looking for new ways to do things, looking for new ways to reach people, looking for new ways to share the message about something you care about. Um, and, I, and I'm really inspired by that, and I know others are drawn to that. There are lots of many amazing artists and creative people who have stayed true to their craft, who have done wonderful things in life. But I feel part of the attractive energy toward you, from across the board, from the most influential leaders in the world, right through to the people who pay hard money for hard tickets to come see you perform, is that your curiosity seems to overshadow convention. I think a simpler way of putting it is, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it, it's like, I don't have ready answers for things, right? I, I don't say, this is the right way. I'm trying to think if there was a simpler way to ask that question. I wonder whether, how you would have thought if I said, yo, yo, Mark, do you know what you're doing? Yeah, I'd say, <laughs> nope, <laughs> and that's the end. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I didn't mean to. No, uh, no, it's totally, I, didn't mean to imply I love that it. You were asking I love it. A, a, a simple question in a complicated way. Yeah. In this day where everybody has opinions about everything, mm. I'm not sure I have opinions about everything. You know, I have a brother-in-law who says, uh, Yo, you'll feel strongly both ways. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't disagree. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, because it's like, and, and, and I think if you're looking for, okay, so let's say we we're talking about Barbara Streisand, she, she knows her truth, right? Let's talk about truth. I think if everybody in this room saw an accident happen across the street and we would each have a slightly different angle, mm. visual angle of see. And, and then you interview every single person and say, okay, what exactly happened? You know, it's, it's a different version of like playing telephone. Mm. <laughs> we would have many different truths. And I think sometimes there's a term that I'm sort of saying, it's a term, but maybe it isn't. I think if you have 360 degree truth, prismatic truth, you know, family truth, you know. Oh, what's that? Exactly. What is it from your point of mm -hmm. view? Three siblings, mm -hmm. very different points of view on what the family was like, right? So it doesn't have to be an accident. Everybody has a family and already you have different viewpoints. Well, something very potent happens when everyone feels comfortable telling their truth, yeah. which really happens more often than not in families. And that's where it becomes very interesting. Yeah. And so you take from family, mm -hmm. you know, to organization, to community, boy, suddenly. Yeah, we've scaled the truth. <laughs> right, right. And so, so how do you, how does all of that combine into something that we can actually all aspire toward together? in a way that is not 
necessarily uh, authority driven. You know, how can we, how can we go for um, maybe goals that are uh, unattainable? You know, in the 1100s, people built cathedrals that took over 100 years to build. You know, so not during my lifetime, but maybe your great grandkids. Do you ever get a chance to sort of express this kind of balance in that environment? Because it's, in it's very interesting. Well. I'm, I can express this to you because, uh, because I think you're kind of interested in, mm. well, we're kind of interested in the same types of things, mm. right? Mm. I mean, you also gauge whether someone's going to go. <sighs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Is this my, know, are these my people? Like, have you thought about yeah. equilibrium these in my your people? life, Mr. Right. President? Right. I mean, that's a good question, though. Yeah, yeah, you have to know your audience, right. right? I mean, I can talk to my children, and my daughter will look at me and say, "What are you talking about?" Says, "Uh oh, I hear lecture coming," <laughs> and then I shut up because yeah. you know it's like it's not you know it's like yeah. And so I I think this is it's nice to talk with you because you're listening to me. <laughs> I'm paid to. <laughs> okay. okay, you have to listen to me. <laughs> so I'll just drone on and I'm on. With and it. on. Let's so go. Another thing. Let me know beep all the tones outside. Let's just keep going. This cafe is a safe space. Yeah. <laughs> I'm three coffees in. Let's keep exactly. going. Exactly. What flight? Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, this idea of, of leaning into Beethoven's work of re reducing the amount of support the music required originally in Beethoven for three, you know, it's it's like, you know, table for three. Yeah, um, exactly. It's it's beautiful. Someone described it as like a, it, it reminded them of Tiny Disc, which I love, this idea of a, of, of a re, of reduced parameters in order to try to capture the emotion. What inspired that? Well, you know what Manny says, my good friend Emmanuel Axe, the pianist, who's playing in, is one of the three people, along with Leonidas Kavakos, the great Greek violinist, I think Manny says, if you were interested in Beethoven symphonies in the 1800s, up until, you know, the recording industry started happening, and you might hear it twice in your life. The only other way you could hear it is if you played it yourself in a Short, in a version for two pianos, or for three people, for a bunch of people. That's it, it's your garage band. That's the only way, you know, if you want a Beethoven symphony cover, you're not gonna hear it any other place, you gotta do it yourself. That's before, you know, Edison came along. So, um, I love that image too, by the way, the three of you just stuck in a laundry room out the back of someone's house, just knocking this, Knocking Beethoven out. Yeah, that's right. And but that's the way uh, people, uh, you know, before the printing press, that's how you got the Bible. <laughs> Someone who was could read would read from them, but you didn't have your own, own copy. That's kind of interesting. Is that what motivated it in the first place, or is that just a happy accident? What, was the that, printing press? Yeah, did that, no, no. Yeah, well, obviously that was a happy accident. Yeah. Look what happened. No, I don't know. There you go. There we go. Uh, no, but you know the idea, as as Emmanuel was saying, as Manny was saying, you know this idea of what it is. Putting that in context, did you have that context when you came together, or did you go, oh yeah, that is what we're doing? Well, it was like, during the pandemic. Right. Orchestras weren't playing. Ain't gonna get a hundred people together in that time. Yeah. yeah. And so we thought, you know, here's a pandemic-proof way to actually say the next time it comes, and it's not us doing it, but you know, Manny has a wonderful uh, friend who's a former student who actually made a lot of the arrangements. And uh, we thought, great, if you want to have music, you know, and everything's falling apart, you can have it. You can have it in smaller form, and it's, it's good, it may not be you know, the best hamburger, but maybe it's a mini burger. But do you feel do you feel kind of punk rock doing it? You talk about being like a yeah. garage band. Does it feel kind of punk rock? Totally. Absolutely, mm. absolutely. It's, I think, uh, it's it's that same configuration, over and over again. Friends coming together over coffee, 
three espressos or whatever, or lots of ketchup, but you know, you, you, you kind of, you just schmooze and, and, and you say, what are we gonna do? Hey, Joe, let's try this. Ah, yeah. oh, come on, no, it's not gonna work. Of course it's gonna work, come yeah. on, yeah. try it. Yeah. Come tomorrow, you know, let's, let's try this. And, and I think we need a lot more of that uh, in order to have participatory responsibility in things. You know, someone else when they were talking about it said, oh, it's a, it's a great step in, into contemporary classical. And I thought, oh, I gotta ask Yo-Yo Ma what he thinks about that term. If we're not really into genres, but we, get, but the, but we love the idea of contemporary, cont contemporization of things, right? The well, idea of updating things, of doing things differently. Yeah, well, listen, what's great about uh, anything contemporary is that it's now. Now is scary to people though sometimes, but did you face any kind of push back in any capacity, even someone like yourself who's achieved and given always, so much. Yeah. Always, yeah. you know, lanes are very important in in order in society. And anytime you kind of switch You're all lanes, over them, you fly all over yeah, the place. But, but if you don't want to get criticized, mm. don't do anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I tell you, I've been criticized so often by so many people. What's the most common criticism? Can you well, remember? When I first came out and started playing concerts, the, the most often asked interview was like, how can an Oriental like you play music? Wow. Like us, you know. So that was like almost every single interview, maybe 40 years ago. But it, you know, it is also sometimes asked very innocently because we make judgments. There were people used to say, women soloists, they can't play like a man. You know, mm -hmm. and the compliment would be, "Oh, she plays like a man." You know, it's just like that's that's gone. But there are lots of, you know, people make sometimes innocent judgments, and sometimes they're tainted with a little more kind of, uh, I don't know, uh, less innocent. Let's say you're very kind, and you see you see good, and I know you you said it beautifully. You know, you want to be with people, you want to learn from people, and see the good in people, but there must have been times when that triggered something in you and you didn't know what to do with it. Well, I think, you know, the one thing that, I grew up in three cultures. So, in France, uh, when we moved to the States, the French would say, why would anybody yeah. want to do that? Yeah. <laughs> it's the greatest culture yeah. in the world. Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and when we came to the States, it was like, well, you know, this is the greatest country. And my parents would say, well, Chinese culture is really great. And, and as a seven-year-old, I would say, you know, then why aren't we living in China? Or why did we leave Paris? Yeah, exactly, you mm -hmm. know, so, so I had a lot of contradictory messages um, uh, sort of pumped into my brain. And um, it's sort of like figuring out code switching without and and actually allowing sort of dropping the barriers so that you're you're comfortable in wherever in all the codes mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and i think part of being an immigrant I, I think my thought is what do i need to be in order to feel that you could like waldo drop me any place in the world and and make do as a musician as a human being said what do you need to do what values do i need to know that a society has for what is desirable undesirable because every society has something slightly different but then also what are the commonalities that are there in every society. Yeah, and you brought that into your music, otherwise I, I don't see how you would have been able to show up so authentically and creatively into so many different environments as well. Well, listen, why are you talking to me? Because you do exactly the same thing. Those are the values you practice. And I think what I observe in you is, is something that I know you practice, and I know that I try to practice, is that is one of hospitality, you know? 
the whole world has rules for hospitality. You have a guest, you show your guest around, the guest shows respect, appreciates the gift you're giving them, and by accepting the gift that you've given them, offered them, they become part of you. Beautifully put. I mean, it's, it's, sometimes people will say to me, you know, why aren't you more critical? Why don't you tell us what you don't like? I've been so fortunate to be able to pick and choose what I play and who I speak to. The concept of choosing something or someone because I don't like it is just not in me. It seems alien to me. Right. The, the idea of wasting time like that. Like, I, I, I just believe the artistic spirit is made of magic. I, 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 I don't think you know. Yo, yo, Ma, do you know what you're doing? Nope. It's magic. Nope. I, 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 I don't know what I'm doing, and I think that's part of what makes me both secure and insecure. I'm secure in knowing that I don't know, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> so in other words, don't yeah. tell me that I don't know what I'm doing because I'll agree with you. So I'm, where's the insecurity? I'm insecure because, you know, I'm coming into an interview, I'm doing a performance, and before that, I actually think, I have no idea what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And then, but then you have to kind of say, all right, hold on for a second. You may not know much, but you know just some things. And let's take what you know and, and make an arc out of it. And, and share that what you don't know and share that experience. You know, you talk about process. Mm. It's like share the process of not knowing and discovering something and be excited by that. When you're on stage, on stages that many would consider to be some of the most, in a conventional sense, high pressure environments, a lot of cameras, a lot of people, important people, an important anniversary, something that's very emotive and requires music in order to create a healing experience. The stakes are high and there's many of them on paper. And you put yourself in that situation because you're drawn to the idea of sharing your gift and being a part of that experience. You do so safe in the knowledge that you don't know what you're doing. Yeah, and, and that you can actually look at someone in the eye and, and be comfortable enough to, okay, I, I, I don't succeed in doing that uh, a lot of the time. That doesn't mean that I, that's not my goal. Mm. Mm. You know, my goal is not to prove to anybody that I'm the smartest person, the most able person in the world, because I'm not. You know, I'm just me and, and you know, and that's it. That's, <laughs> I can't give you more, but I commit myself to give you the best of what I can do. I'm fully committed, I'm 100% committed mm -hmm. to you, to anybody that I'm talking to. I try to be all of myself. I'm not gonna look over your shoulder and say, you know, there's a more interesting person uh, on your left. And, and what's going on over there? No, I mean, I'm undoubtedly, gonna, by the way, but yeah. well, there's a bottle of ketchup there. That I'm, It'll I'm still do the job. Very longing. <laughs> It'll do the same job. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but you know, but that's but that's all we can hope for. Yeah. If a child comes and talks to you, you pay full attention to the child. People get really obsessed, I think, in this particular space of of um, discipline and music with the idea of mastery. You know, like. The more you play it, the better you get, the closer you get to perfection. Yeah. And I, I think on your birthday when you played all, all six suites in a, in a row and, and put yourself through that exercise, um, I wonder how that changed, how that night, I, I wonder whether that kind of made things more simple after that, whether it simplified things for you a little bit because you, know, you exercised everything you'd learned and everything you were passionate about with regards to Bach in that one sitting, it was like, okay, I'm gonna put myself through this, I'm gonna see if I can do this. It, it's, it's about process, but it's about, not about my process, but I think I have a theory that Bach had an idea 
and and it's I'll try and put it simply mm -hmm. is that he only worked two years in his life outside of the church where his employer was not the church so um, and his employer loved music had a lot of musicians around sort of like you know, it's, it's like being in an ideal environment mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. musicians to mm -hmm. just experiment. Mm -hmm. So he was a great experimenter. I think of him as a, as a scientist composer who was just trying everything, needed to figure out what the essence of something was. Human nature, nature. And it's like he's on a great sabbatical. What can I do? And he then located the cello. So what, what, what is that oh. instrument? What can it do? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to figure out how exactly what the cello can do. Mm. And I'm going to write six pieces of music. He likes six. He does a lot of things in sixes. Mm. Brandenburg concertos, mm -hmm. you know, violin partitas and sonatas and whatever. So I'm going to do six uh, suites. And, and so he writes the first three, and after which he says, yep, I... <laughs> I figured out what the cello can do, but now I have to do three more. I said, okay, I now am going to try and get the cello to figure out what I want it to do. Not what the cello can do, but I am a composer. I'm an organist. I can play, you know, six different lines at once with my feet, with my both hands, and I can do all that stuff. Cello has four strings. How can I make the cello do something mm -hmm. that I can do on the organ just on four strings? And so he then writes, it gets, you know, he, he does this thing where tunes down and string, he writes for, adds a string on, on the cello, and I think he succeeds. And I think it's the journey of hearing somebody going through that process of thinking that makes it, you know, reach for the sky. And he actually does the impossible. And which is sort of our human nature is that we always are trying to reach for the impossible. And when you can feel that achievement, you then are part owner of that yeah. incredible. When you carry it. Yeah. It becomes part of your DNA. Right. When it becomes a part of your chemical makeup, when I get the same feeling when I hear a song crescendo each time or a tear comes to my eye each time, no matter where I am, that's part of my makeup. Now. Yeah. That's, you just pinpointed something that I believe in deeply, which is that the magical thing that culture can do, it can actually turn the other into us, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. It's like saying the moment, and you can do that in music, you can do that in literature, you can read, you know, a book like Beloved, and you're not living in that era, you're not of that ethnic group, you're not part of this, but you are brought fully into it, and that experience then becomes part of our life if we've digested it. Yeah, and then we share it. Right. And then, yeah. And that's, for me, the thing that we have not used enough in society to actually break the, the categorical fractures that have sort of to promote us apart. To promote participatory responsibility. Yeah. yeah. Oh, gosh, what an incredible mouthful mm -hmm. that you have. It's, yeah. That's it's it's caloric. It's starting to roll off yeah, the tongue exactly. quite nicely. <laughs> I suspect not, but go right ahead. <laughs> um, our common nature. I want to take some time to talk to you about your relationship with nature. You've always been drawn into nature. Um, and your music does reflect the outside world inside whatever 
and some environment you're playing in, I, it's, it, I, I feel it, others feel it. Do you hear music in nature even when it's not playing? You know what I mean? Do you feel the beat and the rhythm and the melody and the soul? Absolutely. There's, first of all, I think, and many people think, we are nature. That's, so there's, the separation is- That's the problem, right? We, yeah. yeah. We separate ourselves. Yeah. yeah, when we separate ourselves from nature, then, you know, you can extract we can from nature without yeah. consequence, yeah. right? Yeah. But if you are nature, mm -hmm. then whatever you do to nature, we're actually doing to ourselves. Well, we wouldn't commodify, well, not all of us, but hopefully majority of us wouldn't commodify our offspring or our family in the same way we do nature because we don't see a separation between. Right, that's right. So if so, that's that's number one. And I think if there's, I think scientists and poets or scientists and artists agree that that's actually basically it. So our common nature is really that's the what human you said, nature yeah. of nature, right? Yeah, that's, you right know, that's, that's, that's our commonality. And if you start from that, uh, I'll give you an example. It's, it's actually kind of interesting because it has, refers specifically to cello practice. The beginning of the first cello suite by Bach. You know, the first thing you ever learned. Yeah. Thank you. Did your research. And uh, so if I play it as a piece of cello music, you know, I, I go start, you know, vibrant, mm -hmm. that sounds nice. It's never worked for me. It, I don't feel right playing it. I feel like it's, you know, it's the wrong energy and whatever. So the way I get around it is I actually think that the one, the piece of music started long before it's already I playing. start. Secondly, <laughs> I visualize the idea of something like a brook flowing. And you know how if a leaf falls, you know, it, it just gets, it yeah. just gets caught yeah. in that. You just join it. You're not going like this. And that's one example of how we are a part of nature. Another thing is music, us human beings, we're 60% water, right? And take music. Music is just three things. It's energy because it's sound moves air molecules and the air molecules hit your eardrum and then your brain interprets what it is, right? So it's sound, it's energy and it's time and Music toys with time through that irregular and irregular. When you get irregular patterns, pa patterns, you're toying with someone's sense of time, right? And space. It takes you to a different uh, consciousness level, state of mind. So when you're on stage, what is your relationship with conventional time whilst you're playing? Well, I think it's in a way, when you're on stage, you're in a bubble because the bubble is the ecosystem of whatever is the space you're in. If it's a hall, it's a, it's a contained bubble. Everybody in that contained space is subject to the energy of the air molecules that's floating around, being refracted, reflected, and, and it hits them. The attitude I have in playing is as much as possible, never trying to prove something, uh, and always trying to show, well, I, I pretend, or I really think, that I am the host of a giant party. Because if I'm in a city, I'm a guest in the city. You know, I arrive, I don't live there. I try and figure out who's living in that city, who's in that community. But when I'm on stage, I'm the host. You know, because if you're on a stage, 
you have heightened position. If you ever have somebody on stage staring at you and you're in the audience, oh. you feel how oh, yeah. powerful that eye contact is. Oh yeah, you feel so special. Right, and so, so you have to respect that. Mm -hmm. And I'm the host, and nobody's there trying to say, show me how good the party is gonna be. They're there to enjoy the party. And I'm there to share what I think is pretty neat about what might be happening. That's it. So if things can go wrong, that's fine. Mm -hmm. And if things go right, we're all in it together. So what does legacy mean to you now if you seem so capable of finding a moment and respecting it, trying not to spend too much time what came before and predict what is going to happen, which is the ideal state. Because left and right at that moment, right. it's kind of anxiety on a stick. Right. So this feels like a life in, 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 in practicing of that, of that exercise and your ability allows you to find a moment, stay there. What does it all mean, do you think, at the end? What, what, is, what does it all mean? Because I've traveled so much, because I have was privileged to have people guide me into a lot of different uh, ways of thinking, uh, disciplines, um, continents, and and I realize you know what I know is yeah. that much, right? So I yeah. you know I've got. Curiosity can't even scratch say, the surface. Yeah, exactly. But I realize that, you know, and I'm one of eight billion people on Earth. The good thing and bad thing about being 68 years old is that uh, I've seen generations go by. I'm aware that there are at least four generations that are younger than I am. And I'm aware that 50% of the world's population is under 27. Of that 50%, about of the males, about 40% are unemployed. So that's a statistic that is a little less than abstract and it, it feels, you know, I, I, I want to feel that this is palpable. It's not just, tangible. It's, yeah, it's not just something that is. is not a number. Is, yeah, it's not a number. And I'm thinking, well, what can I do? I can't do much. But the only thing that I can do is to think, well, as I get older, you know, the proportional population uh, of the world is going to be younger and younger than I, than I am. And so what do they need? You know, so if I'm in the company of older people, I like to say, how much do you know what a younger person is thinking about? And, and there's some older people that say, oh, Gen Z's, you know, they're lazy, they don't care, you know, they don't come on time, they don't feel like doing something, whatever. Sure, they may be that, but I also know a lot of people who care deeply and are actually concerned about, I think, the right things that we should Same. all be concerned about. Same. And yeah. And, and, and what I would like to do is to encourage, you know, my peers mm. to say, if you have, you know, access to things, share it as quickly as possible and give them the chance rather than say, you know, kid, you wait until you're, you know, go through all the what I had to go through, so, yeah. <laughs> so earn it, yeah. because it'll be too late. There is zero value in that for me. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. Exactly. Zero. So just, <laughs> yeah. you know, really tell them what you know. Yeah. And tell them, give them the access to say, look, these are the keys, this is the door, and let's share this so that, you know, if I have something to say that's valuable to you, but you take on the responsibility. It's because we want to succeed in our lifetime. Yeah. We want to own our story, succeed, and then you can learn about it after I'm gone. You're right, we don't do a good enough job of sharing. Yeah, and so it's not, you know, again, it's a lot of things, you know, Barbara Streisand said the same things. You know, I don't need to perform more, I don't need to do this, I don't need to do that. But what, you, what she does need to do 
is something else. And, and I'm thinking, you know, let's figure out what younger people really feel they need and what is it that we can do to actually help them, you know, to maybe nothing, you know, maybe they're already set. Or if there's anything that you can do, do it. Do it now. That's our best investment. Do you know what you're doing? No, not at all. I forget what I'm doing. That's the other thing. <laughs> I not only don't, don't know what I'm doing, <laughs> and I can't hear that well. What did you say? <laughs> I mean, we're recording anyway. This whole thing is just seeming to yeah, get you. Okay. Surprise, this we'll, wasn't being filmed. We'll start in five minutes, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're recording. Bring the coffee. <laughs>